We live in a country and an economy in a time where as women, they tell us that we can be anything we want to be when we grow up. But with that freedom comes this pressure of deciding, who do you want to be? To avoid socially awkward moments at Christmas or Thanksgiving, you have a clear goal for your family. But that's not the only question you're going to have to answer. You're going to have to tell friends and neighbors what college you're going to go to and what you plan on doing with your degree, a degree that you haven't even gotten yet. Then, after graduation, at every interview, you'll have to answer, so where do you see yourself in five years? Each of these questions imply that we need to have this ideal goal in mind to be successful, and that we need to have this well-reasoned path for what we're doing and how that's going to get us one step closer to that ideal goal. Before I tell you what I wanted to be when I grew up, I want you to think about your answer. Yes, adults too. What do you want to be when you grow up? And then hold it in your mind. Okay, does everyone have one? When I was growing up, I wanted to be a horse trainer. After all, I loved horses. I knew that training horses was a job. I knew people had that job. And a good friend at the time, she wanted to be a veterinarian so we could split the business. This was perfect. And that's the thing about deciding what you want to be when you grow up. You can only dream about what you believe is possible for you to achieve. And it's likely that you'll dream about something familiar. Think about the job that you chose. First of all, it's a job that currently exists. Second, you probably know someone who has that job. And third, it's something that appeals to your current interests. Research has shown that what we want to be when we grow up, or our occupational aspirations, are heavily influenced by the jobs of our parents, by what we believe that we are capable of at that moment, our perceived abilities, and the jobs of our neighbors and friends. These influences are strongest when we're younger, in third, fourth, and fifth grade, when we are first deciding what we want to be when we grow up. And once we pick that path, we're supposed to stick to it. And that might work for you. That might happen. But I want to take a second to take a moment to tell you that it might not happen that way. And not only is that OK, it might even be better. This talk, it's for the people who don't know what they want to be when they grow up. But it's also for the people who do know, who are absolutely certain. Why? Because I don't want you to put a ceiling to what you can achieve based on what you want to be today. I don't want you to feel trapped in a career path that you feel pressured to follow. And I don't want you to worry that one misstep will make you a failure or take you away from achieving this one singular perfect goal. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my life. And my life looks more like this squiggly line than some straight path. And when that line stops, and when it drops, and it picks up on the other side, I call those cliffs. It's a moment in my life when everything was going fine. I was on the straight path, progressing upwards towards whatever was next. And then I chose to take a risk. The first time that I jumped off one of those cliffs was my second year of high school. The linear path would say that after the second year of high school, you take the third year of high school. Following this path wasn't meant to be very difficult. But I didn't want to be in high school anymore. It's a little weird being here today. <laughs> I had great propositions for what else I could do. I could drop out. I could get my GED. I could go to this local school where kids taught themselves and there were no teachers, and you graduated with no high school diploma. Needless to say, my parents were not very excited about any of these options. So my mom came home with a pamphlet about exchange programs. There hadn't been an exchange student from my school in nearly 30 years, so I didn't know what to expect. But I decided to leave my friends, my family, my school, my GPA, and everything that I knew to spend a year in Cardiff, Wales, a place I couldn't even point out on the map. And I had a blast. The thing about jumping off the linear path is that once you do it, you realize that you're not locked in. 
In college, I jumped between several different schools, trying out different worlds. Each time that I jumped, my little pouch of confidence grew, and I gained skills for adapting new systems and meeting new people in new communities. But then life happened. My last year of college, I got very sick. Somehow I did manage to graduate with my BA in psychology, but I wasn't worried about what I wanted to be when I grew up. I was just worried about what I wanted to do, what I could do at that moment. And I knew that I could not sit at a desk anymore and I had to get away from the stress at school if I was going to get better. I saw a dog trainer and I thought, that looks fun, I can do that. So I started training dogs. I was living in Worthing near Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas at the time, and I saw a flyer about raising military working dogs. And I thought, that sounds cool. So I signed up for that too. I raised three military working dogs, including this one featured on the cover of the Airman's Magazine, named Respect. I was at a good place in my life. I was moving up in the dog training industry. I had my health back. I was even doing something that was close to what I dreamed of as a kid. After all, both dogs and dolphins, uh, both dogs and horses have four legs. And I was training, wasn't I? But it just didn't feel like enough. I remembered this feeling of restlessness from high school. And I thought that maybe there was something out there that I hadn't found yet. So I did what any person with a question would do. I Googled it. And that's when I found out that the US Navy trains dolphins. It was pretty clear when I learned that, that I had to go there. So I jumped again. I moved to San Diego, California to learn from the trainers at the Navy Marine Mammal Program. Okay, at this point, I was beyond what I thought I was going to do as a kid. Training dolphins was way cooler than horses. But I found myself more interested in the research than the training. At the Navy Marine Mammal Program, they do research with their sea lions and their dolphins on their behavior and their hearing. I'd never met a marine mammal researcher. None of my friend's parents were marine mammal researchers. In the child book, along with firefighter, teacher, doctor, there was no line for marine mammal researcher. But looking at them, I realized that I wanted to be a marine mammal researcher. So I jumped again. I moved back to Texas and I joined Dr. Heather Hill uh, at SeaWorld San Antonio. I have a video, we're gonna see if we can play it. <laughs> so I wanna introduce you to some of my uh, research colleagues. So they were pretty great. We presented our research at prestigious national conferences, and we published our work in peer-reviewed academic journals. I had a clear foothold in the animal research industry, and I knew that I could keep going and be a successful full-time researcher. But I think you're guessing at this point that that's not what I did. I found out that there was this professor, Dr. Mark Frank, who studied nonverbal signs of deception. That's reading your body language and facial expressions to determine if you're lying. Oh, I knew that I had to meet him. So I applied to his program. Now this is clearly distinct from anything that I had done before. These were people. They were not dolphins. There was no food. There was no animal fur. It was just people. But I was accepted. And they gave me a full scholarship and a TA position. So I jumped up to Buffalo, New York, and spent two years researching human deception and teaching undergraduate students about communication. The obvious next step for me after completing my master's degree was to go on for a PhD. There was only one program that I seriously applied to. It was the school that I really wanted. And I got in. They offered me a full scholarship 
and a living stipend for five years. All I had to do was say yes in the next 24 hours. But something had happened when I was in school. I had taught myself how to code. And I had met women who were computer coders and who worked in the technology industry. These women, they were like me. But they were doing jobs that I had never imagined were a possibility for someone like me. I looked down that path of attending the PhD program, and I realized that it wasn't what I wanted anymore. I wanted to be in the technology industry. So I called the program, and I told them, no. This was the biggest cliff that I had ever encountered. I looked back at all the little cliffs, all the times that I had reinvented myself, all the times that I had become something that I never imagined was possible, and I told myself and everyone around me that I could do this. It was hard. Do you remember my friend who I mentioned who wanted to be a veterinarian? She was graduating from vet school. I want to be honest with you. Jumping off cliffs, taking risks with your career path, it isn't easy, and it isn't always something that you choose. But if you take these risks when you're younger, you will have some bumps and bruises, but you will become a better jumper, and you will be ready when you're older and there are bigger cliffs with bigger, re bigger risks and bigger rewards. And at this point, I was an experienced cliff jumper. From moving between schools and states and countries, I had learned how to build a community, so I started building. I joined local volunteer organizations, tech groups, and I sought, sought out mentors. From changing from animal trainer to researcher to teacher, I had learned how to rapidly retool for free. So I began taking courses on edX, Coursera, MIT, Yale, and Stanford's OpenCourseWare. I watched YouTube lectures, did some Khan Academy, read library books, and went to talks by local experts. On my birthday of this year, I got to the other side of that cliff. I got a call from EFSI offering me a job to work with the Network Operations Group for the Earth Observing Satellites at NASA. Video? Thank you. Uh, <laughs> it's not the end. My friend actually sent me that video uh, when I got my job. <laughs> so what do you want to be when you grow up? Where do you see yourself in five years? The world needs the kind of people who are going to stick to a linear path and develop skills and expertise in fields like medicine. But the world? It also needs the kind of people who are willing to take risks. With each technological innovation, jobs are lost to automation and jobs are created that demand skills that didn't exist before. Skills that nobody learned about in school for careers that no one was planning on filling. These jobs, they need the kind of people who are willing to take risks. The kind of people who can jump out of what's familiar to them into the unknown they can learn skills and adapt quickly all the things that you learn jumping off cliffs. The job that you might do 15 or 20 years from now, it might not even exist yet. My generation, millennials, we graduated into this world of technology. 
and we job hopped more than any generation in history. It turns out that I'm not so unique. Millennials tend to have up to four jobs before we're in our early 30s, and those jobs can be in completely separate industries. This process of recreating yourself, it's part of the fabric of the American dream. It's what makes us a resilient, adaptable society. Along the way, I met people who were leaving jobs they hated in marketing, IT, management, to train dogs and dolphins. Dolphin trainers that I learned from, most of them are middle school teachers now. And the graduate students I went to school with are scattered across a wide variety of career paths. This question, what do you want to be when you grow up? I'd argue that it's not helpful or realistic for all of us to have this one singular ideal goal in mind. Encouraging us to pick a goal when we're younger and then stick to it locks us into the jobs of our parents, the jobs of our neighborhoods. When I speak to other women in the technology industry, I hear stories that sound a lot like mine. Many of us have degrees in the fine arts and the social sciences. We had jobs in marketing, HR, and dog training before we found our jobs in technology. Along the way, many of us met someone who realized that people like us could have jobs and love jobs like that. So what I want to leave you with is this. Don't let what you think you're going to be when you grow up put blinders on you. Don't let it become a ceiling that you're not looking at what else is out there. And don't worry that not getting that perfect job or the, the right school is going to make you a failure or take you off this one path to success. If you see something awesome, something that you think is awesome and no one else, you can do that thing and then you can do something else completely unrelated and then you can see something else awesome and do that and then you can do something else too. All you have to do is take your first jump.